So it's a pleasure um, for me to introduce you, uh, Mara Volpi. Uh, she's uh, a postdoc at the Department of uh, Mathematics in uh, Tor Vergata University. And she got uh, his master degree uh, in pure and applied uh, mathematics uh, in Tor Vergata in 2015. Uh, with a thesis on the effects of stellar jets on protoplanetary disks. And then Mara uh, moved to the Université de Namur in uh, Belgium, uh, where she got his PhD in science in uh, 2019, uh, with a thesis on the stability of non-coplanar extrasolar systems, uh, which is also the uh, topic of today's talk. So I ask Mara to to start the, the seminar. Thanks. So do you see my screen? Yes. OK, perfect. OK, so um, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thanks uh, to the organizers for having set up this uh, session of uh, webinars, despite our current situation. And thanks, Luca, for the, for the introduction. Uh, as I said, I am currently working at the Department of Mathematics at the University of Tor Vergata uh, in a group that is, that is working up on uh, Laplace-like resonances inside and outside uh, the solar system, which again is not something that I'm going to talk to you about today because we are going to talk about stability of non-coplanar extrasolar systems. As Luca was um, starting to say, these are, are the results that I obtained during my PhD at the University of Namur, so, thanks uh, to a fellowship of the FNRS under the supervision of Professor Hans Philibert and in collaboration with the University of Tor Vergata and the University of Milan. Basically, the whole work behind the um, work, uh, the, the question behind the work was uh, can exoplanetary systems be in 3D long-term stable configurations? Before tackling this question, I would like to answer some preliminary questions. For uh, some of you, these uh, might be, um, might be uh, questions that are quite basic, but I would like to be sure that we are all starting from a common ground. So first of all, what is an exoplanetary system? Secondly, why is it different than the solar system? And finally, does asking this question actually makes any sense? So I will start with an introduction to the marvelous world of exoplanets. First of all, what is an exoplanetary system? Uh, it is a system that has uh, a star or multiple star at the center and uh, one planet or multiple planets that are revolving around the central bodies. In order to describe the evolution of the planets around the central body, we use the so-called orbital parameters. They can be divided in three subcategories. So we have those that define the orbit shape, the orbit position in, in space, and the position of the planet on the orbit. We are going to talk um, a lot about the semi-major axis A, that is one of those defining the shape, that basically tells us the, the distance of the planet with respect to the central body. We are also going to talk a lot about uh, the eccentricity, that basically tells us the uh, actual shape of the orbit. If we have eccentricity equal to zero, we are talking about a circular orbit. And the, great, the bigger the value of the eccentricity E, the more elliptic is the orbit we are talking about up until the um, critical point of E equal to one, where we don't have a closed orbit anymore. Concerning the position of the orbit in space, uh, with respect to a reference frame that, that we have chosen, um, let's focus in particular on I, which is the inclination of the orbit with respect to the uh, reference frame, and uh, um, small omega, which is the argument of the pericenter that basically gives us the position of the closest point of the orbit to uh, the central body. Uh, so for each planet, we will need the, um, to, to describe completely the, the evolution of the motion, we will need the uh, six parameters. For us, an exoplanetary system is going to be formed by one central star and two planets revolving around it. 
we say that an exoplanetary system is a resonant exoplanetary system, a system if uh, its planets move in a particular configuration, meaning that the periods, so the times that they need to complete an orbit, are somehow prom proportional to each other. In the solar system, the most uh, famous resonance is the 5 to 2 between Jupiter and Saturn, which means that each five orbits of Saturn, we have exactly two orbits, uh, each five orbits of Jupiter, sorry, we have exactly two uh, orbits of Saturn. Uh, in particular, I'm defining a resonant exoplanetary system because we are going to work on non-resonant exoplanetary systems. So not systems that have this kind of uh, particular configuration. Now, why are uh, exoplanetary systems in general different than the solar system? The solar system is obviously the first planetary system, the system that we have known of as we are right in the middle of it. And it has been studied for centuries. So there are lots of feature that, no, features of the solar system that we know. But I'm going to uh, highlight just three of them. The first one is that there is a clear division in the distribution of the planets in the system. As we have the closest planets to the sun, that are small and rocky, and the outer planets that are um, gas and giant. The other two um, features are going to be highlighted by this video. If we have a look, what we see is that actually the orbits basically lay on the same plane. There are small tilts, but we can basically say that they, they are coplanar. And if we look at the orbits from above, what we see is that they are basically almost circular. So we have three features. Uh, small rocky planets on the inside, gas giant on the outside, coplanarity and uh, circular orbits. And so at the beginning, this was seen as uh, the model for every planetary system. So um, initially, um, the theories for uh, the formation and the evolution of planetary system had the um, solar system as the final result. But everything came to a halt with the very first discovery of an exoplanet in 1995. And that was because the sun is actually a sun-like star, so it's comparable um, to our sun. And the planet, 51 Pegasi b, it is actually comparable to our, um, to our Jupiter. But where Jupiter needs 12 years, to com almost 12 years, to complete a uh, revolution around our sun, 51 Pegasi b only needs four days. And this is because it is extremely uh, close to the star, such that uh, this kind of planets are called hot Jupiters because they are comparable to Jupiters to Jupiter, but are uh, much more closer to the sun than our Jupiter. This video was created to celebrate the first 4,000 discoveries of exoplanets. And what we have found, uh, the more we gathered uh, data about uh, exoplanets, is that they actually um, have a much larger variety of values for the orbital parameters than that that we can observe in our solar system. Especially when we consider the eccentricities of, uh, of these systems. In here you see the discoveries color coded by um, uh, observation techniques that uh, made the discoveries. And you're going to see on the top left in just a few seconds an incredible pileup that was given by the discoveries of the Kepler mission. So again, we said eccentricities. In this plot, you have on the x-axis the semi-major axis, so the distance of the planet from the star, and on the y-axis the uh, orbital eccentricity. And what you see is that, first of all, we tend to find uh, planets that are closer to the star, but I'm going to uh, come back on this uh, in a while. Uh, but what I would like to stress with this plot is the variety of eccentricities that we, that we can find. Just to give you an idea, if we had to put my, uh, Earth and Jupiter on this plot, they would appear uh, here below. So, we have found so many um, exoplanets. We are gathering more and more data. But how well do we know the complete structure of this system? And the answer is this well. 
because the problem is that all the observational methods have uh, some biases that do not allow us to have the complete set of parameters that we need in order to describe exactly what's happening in the system. I'm not going to focus on uh, all the um, detection techniques, um, just know that when we uh, say that we have discovered a planet or that we have seen a planet, uh, for the vast majority of, um, of times, we haven't actually seen directly the planet, but we have inferred its position by observation or something else. Now, the first uh, observation methods I would like to talk about is the transit method that you might have heard of because it was the method that we used by the Kepler mission so it was actually cited in the news uh, in the last few years uh, many times. So this is one, uh, one example when I say that we don't actually see the planet. What we observe in the transit is the light that is actually emitted by the star. And what happens is that if a planet has to, is to, be, to pass between ourselves and the, the star that we are uh, looking at, what we're going to, uh, to notice is a dumping of the light flux that we are receiving from the star. Um, now, this is, one, this is the main effect. There are, um, uh, there are many secondary effects that can be combined in order to obtain more information, but let's say that this is the uh, main idea behind the transit. Now, the transit method is highly efficient, as we have seen. Kepler has discovered thousands of new um, exoplanets, and it is, in principle, able to uh, detect systems that have very different characteristics between each other as for masses or semi-major axis of, um, of the planets. On the other side, it is difficult to constrain um, eccentricities uh, for planets that are detected by, by transit. A precise geometry is required because the planet has to pass exactly in front of us in order to be able to detect its presence. And confirmations are always required because there, there are a lot of effects that could produce um, uh, the effects, sorry for the repetition, uh, the effects that we that we observe that not necessarily are um, exo the, are exoplanets. The second method I would like to describe is the radial velocity, which is particularly important because it was uh, the first implemented method. It is the responsible for the uh, first discovery, and more importantly for us, we are going to focus on systems that are um, discovered by uh, radial velocity method. So basically, when we have a two-body gravitational problem, the two bodies are uh, rotating around the common center of mass. Now, as the star is much bigger than the planet, the common center of mass is going to be much closer to the star, if not into the star. So what happens is that we, um, we see the most obvious uh, revolution of the planets around the center of mass, but the star is rotating as well. So when we are observing a star, there is going to be a moment, if this is happening, of course, there's going to be a moment where the star is coming towards us. And there's going to be another period in which the star is going farther away. In terms of the spectrum of the star that we are observing, this translates into shifts towards the red or towards the blue. So again, we are inferring the presence of the planet. We are not uh, actually seeing the planet. Now, the problem of the radial velocity method is that we are capable of detecting only the movement of the star that is happening along our line of sight, which means that if um, the system is completely perpendicular to us, we're going to see nothing because the uh, projection of the movement along our line of sight is going to be zero. On the other, on the other hand, if, uh, as in this case, um, the system was to be completely horizontal, let's say, then we would see the complete magnitude of the movement. And this is one of the, um, on the downsides of the radial velocity, as we're going to see in a moment. As um, good points, again, it is highly efficient and gives good constraints uh, for the eccentricities. 
Another downside of the um, radial velocity is that it detects mainly giant planets because the bigger the planets, the bigger is going to be the movement of the star and therefore um, the more visible is going to be the effect on the spectrum uh, of the star. The problem is that we have no information about the inclinations of the system. I say inclinations because I mean two different inclinations. The first one is the inclination of the orbital plane with respect to our uh, line of sight. So when the problem that I was uh, talking about a moment ago. What happens is that we suppose that we are always in the best case scenario so that the um, system is actually horizontal with respect to our line of sight. So we uh, suppose that the um, movement and the, the shifts that we see are actually the whole magnitude of the movement and of the shifts. But this might not be the case. So actually what we are uh, deducing are only minimal values for the masses of the planets. And secondly, we have no clues about the 3D structure of the system, meaning that if there are more than one planet, the, the more than one planet, um, and the orbits of the planets are tilted with respect to each other, so we don't have a coplanar system, there is no way that we can uh, actually uh, derive this information by the observations. This actually gives us our goal. For systems that have two planets, we want to identify values of the mutual inclinations that are, that are compatible with the long-term stability. So we want to give constraints for possible 3D architectures of the system. I have to say that we are actually setting the hypothesis that these systems are stable. In principle, we could be looking at a configuration that is not stable, but statistically speaking, as uh, an unstable uh, configuration would last a small fraction of the lifetime of the system, it would, be, it would mean that we are extremely lucky or unlucky, depending on the point of view. So actually, it is quite safe uh, to say that with the, um, the systems that we are seeing are, in fact, stable. Now, that's asking the question about 3D configurations that are uh, stable on the long term make any sense. Well, um, if you remember, I have highlighted three features of the solar system. So, and we have already seen that not necessarily uh, the uh, closest, the planet, the uh, smallest and the rockiest it has to be. And we have already seen that not necessarily we have to have circular orbits. So does this apply to the fact that we have coplanar uh, orbits in our solar system? The fact is that despite the technical limitations that we have, we know at least three systems that have relevant 3D architectures. In particular, uh, the most famous case is the one of Upsilon Andromeda, that coincidentally was, even, was also the first one uh, for which we could uh, derive this kind of value. And we have a mutual inclination of almost 30 degrees. So the take back is that yes, it could work. Um, and so it makes sense actually to try and find constraints for the mutual inclination. We're going to follow two different approaches, but both of them are going to be into the Hamiltonian framework. So we have the Hamiltonian that gives us the energy of the system. We define um, the Hamilton equations and therefore we have a system of differential equations. In the case we are able to uh, solve this system, then we can write the explicit, the explicit, explicit solution, sorry, and, and so we can easily know how the system is evolving. Unfortunately, the three-body uh, gravitational problem is not integrable, and therefore we need to work a little bit more in order to obtain the same thing. We are going to take into account only gravitational forces and therefore the total angular momentum of the system is conserved. We have a constant vector, therefore the orthogonal plane is a constant plane. It has a particular name, it's the Laplace plane. And in our case, it's particularly interesting because when we express the Hamiltonian with respect to uh, this reference frame, uh, we found out the uh, Hamiltonian does not depend on two of the 12 orbital parameters that we need to describe the system, but only on their difference. 
and that it actually is always equal to a constant. Therefore, we can easily reduce the degrees of freedom of the system. Now, our targets are going to be non-resonant, two-planet, radial velocity detected systems. We are going to set the Laplace plane, obviously, as our uh, reference frame, and we choose a particular set of variables. Once we have done this, we can write our Hamiltonian and, uh, in these variables and expand it as a series. And I would like to point out that uh, we've expanded this Hamiltonian in the variables and in this particular um, parameter, which is a normalized angular momentum deficit, which is basically a, con a quantity that uh, tells us how our system is far from being um, from having coplanar and circular orbits. So if d2 is equal to zero, then we are in the coplanar and circular orbit case. For us, it's particularly interesting because it is directly re related to the mutual inclination between the planets. So we are basically transferring the study of the constraints for the mutual inclination to this parameter d2, but we, go, we can go back and forth as we, as we want. Now, the first approach that we uh, applied is the reverse KM approach. It is based on the Kolmogorov Arnold Moser uh, theory that can be uh, quite technical and might be a little bit uh, difficult to grasp um, on, the, on the spot. So in order to give you the general idea, and the experts will forgive me for this, we're going to follow an unorthodox, unorthodox path. So this is a donut. We are uh, spending a lot of time at home, so we might be cooking a little bit more. Let's say that I want to make the donut. I'm going to uh, get the correct ingredient list. I'm going to follow the recipe, and if I don't make so, too many mistakes, I'm going to be able to make the donut. Now, what happens if I keep adding flour to the uh, ingredient list? Am I going to be able to make the donut? Is there any um, limit quantity after which it is impossible to get the donut? This is basically the idea of the KM theory. So we take an integrable system, we add a small perturbation, and the, the main idea is that if the perturbation is small enough, then it exists as, as a particular set of variables for which the motion lies on a torus. It means that we can apply a set uh, of uh, multiple transformations uh, that are going to give us a formulation of the Hamiltonian that is particularly uh, easy. The system that we're going to derive of a differential equation is going to be of this form, and therefore, we're going to have that this particular torus uh, is invariant. So if the motion starts on the torus, it's going to stay on the torus. If we can construct <clears throat> this torus, then we say that the system is uh, KM stable. So this is our torus. I would like to stress the fact that I'm not saying that the planets are going to move on the torus. What I'm saying is that we can uh, transform our, I mean, our Hamiltonian in such a way that in, the, in this new framework, the motion is going to evolve on the torus. But then we have to go back to reality and see how this translates on uh, the actual planets. A torus looks a lot like a donut. Um, in our example, the correct ingredient list uh, corresponds to the integrable Part, and when we add more flour, uh, it means that we are adding a perturbation. In the planetary case, the correct ingredient list are the two Keplerian problems. When we consider the two planets evolving separately, we know exactly how to write the solution. The problem is that the two planets are interacting with each other, and that's where the perturbation is coming from. Now, we say reverse KM approach because actually the idea is to reverse the usual KM approach. The stability is not the uh, final result, but it's something that we set as, um, that we actually prescribe. So we have a set of initial conditions. Some of them are given by the observation, so they are known. Some of them are unknown. So we set some values for this unknown, 
and we start the procedure with this set of initial conditions. If we get to the end, then it means that the uh, set of initial condition is um, compatible with the KM stability. Otherwise, we need to discard these values and, um, and try something else. We start with the Hamiltonian that I have already shown you, and we process it through some preliminary transformations in order to obtain the most suitable form. Uh, you will see that I said secular Hamiltonian, because actually, as we are interested in the long-term evolution of the system, um, then we can average over the fast uh, angles, so the fast motion, meaning that we are not really interested in how the planet is evolving on the orbits, but more on how the orbits are evolving in space. Once we arrive at this point, we can visualize the uh, final Hamiltonian that we, that we have obtained in this way. So on the rows, we have the dependency on the action uh, variable p, and on the columns, the uh, dependency on the um, angle variables q. So remember that our goal is to try to obtain this kind of formulation. And we're going to get there by an iterative algorithm erasing one term at a time. Now, I should point out that each time that we are uh, applying a transformation uh, to this Hamiltonian, we are actually changing the variables. So in, to be completely um, precise, I should change the name of the variables as well, but by a reason of, of notation, we are going to keep uh, calling them P and Q. So we start tackling the first term. And in order to do that, we defined uh, the so-called generating function Q1 in such a way that this homological equation involving Poisson brackets is, um, is satisfied. And to this generating, equation, uh, generating function is associated a coordinate transformation that we're going to apply to the whole Hamiltonian. So we're going to obtain an intermediate Hamiltonian that is the transformation of the initial Hamiltonian by uh, th this transformation. And then we obtain the zero where we wanted the zero to be, hopefully, if we did everything right. Now we tackle the second uh, term we're interested in, and we basically do the same thing. We compute a second generating function, K2, that is going to solve this homological equation. Again, to the generating function K2, it is associated a coordinate transformation. We apply the transformation to the Hamiltonian, and we're going to obtain this. Now, the term in red is now linear in P, and it does not depend on Q anymore because of how we defined the generating function. And it has actually the same functional properties of um, omega times P. So what we can do is to collapse the two of them uh, just by redefining the value of omega. So this is the first step. Note that for each step now we have two generating functions. If the system satisfied certain uh, um, hypotheses, we could iterate this algorithm, algorithm ad infinitum. Obviously, we are not going to do that, but we're going to stop uh, when we reach uh, an approximation that is good enough. Obviously, we don't want to do that by hand. Therefore, we need to find a way to automatize the algorithm as much as we can. And in particular, we need to set a um, convergence um, condition. Heuristically speaking, uh, the, if the uh, algorithm is converging, the norm of the second generating function decreases exponentially with R. This is easily um, uh, written. Uh, in order for our computers to understand it. And we have this kind of behavior. So on the left, uh, something that is uh, actually converging uh, pretty well. And on the right, the case where uh, the algorithm is not uh, converging. And therefore, it means that uh, we will have to uh, discard the initial conditions associated to that. We further improve the algorithm by using interval arithmetics. This means that the coefficients are not going to be single values, but intervals. So we start by this. So um, uh, again, as I was saying, these are the, these are the results. 
And so we reach up to uh, 20 degrees of uh, mutual inclination. Now, we have some drawbacks when considering this algorithm. The first one is that we have quite some limitations on the applicability because we managed to apply this um, algorithm only to systems that have um, eccentricity lower than 0 0.1. And as I hope I stressed uh, enough, uh, actually exoplanets show a much larger variety of values. So we are actually quite limiting our, ourselves. And the second thing is that we are putting heavy conditions for the convergence of the algorithm. algorithm. So maybe we are actually discarding um, values that in principle are compatible with the, with the stability, the long-term stability of the system, but not with the convergence of the algorithm. On the other hand, we have some highlights. So we obtain much faster results than purely numerical integrators. And thanks to the interval arithmetics, we can provide a synthetic coverage of the initial conditions, which is not something that uh, could be done by uh, purely numerical integrators. Up to our knowledge, it was the first application to exoplanets that provided an explicit algorithm to construct the KM Tori. And we have to notice that despite the heavy requirements that we are setting on the initial conditions, we obtain results that are somehow uh, comparable with the few observed ones that we are certain of. So this is what we achieved with the first approach. The second one went into a quite different um, direction. Uh, we uh, focused particularly on the lead of Kozai resonance, which is a protective mechanism for highly uh, 3D systems that appear around 40 degrees, but it depends on the parameters of the system. And in the Laplace plane, which is the plane that we are using, um, the action of the lead of Kozai resonance is represented by the argument of the pericenter of the inner planet that librates around a particular value. If you remember, the argument of the pericenter tells us the position of the closest point to the, of the orbit to the star. So when we have the lead of Kozai resonance acting, we see some peculiar um, behaviors along the evolution of the orbital parameters. So first of all, uh, the eccentricities can vary a lot. The fact is that they do it in a coherent fashion so that uh, despite the fact that they can change quite a lot, the system is anyhow regular and stable. And the second is the liberation of the argument of the pericenter. So as you can see in the bottom plot, um, the blue line is the argument of the pericenter of the outer planet, and you see that it circulates in the sense that it takes all the values from minus pi to pi. Whereas the uh, argument of the pericenter of the inner planet in red uh, moves around a certain value, but it basically stays around that value. As we are far from in motion resonances, we can take a secular approximation, as uh, I already mentioned, and the strategy is to do a parametric study via uh, numerical integrations of the Hamiltonian equations given by this approximation. So one could ask if actually what we are attaining is, um, is really relatable. In red, we have the results obtained with uh, the integration of our secular approximation, and in blue, the one obtained by purely numerical integration. So considering the complete problem. Here are the results for a mutual inclination of 20 degrees. So we see that the traces um, compare pretty well. And then we start increasing the value of the, the mutual inclination going up to 40 and 50 degrees. And what we see is that actually the traces overimpose quite well. And even when we get up to 80 degrees, the traces do not overimpose well. But qualitatively speaking, we are describing uh, the same system anyway. Now, we need to set uh, the parametric study and we need to fix our initial conditions. So our set of initial conditions, again, is going to be formed by parameters that we know that are coming from the observations and parameters that we do not know. In this particular case, we are going to play with the inclination of the orbital um, of the system uh, with respect to our line of sight. So we're going to change the masses as well. We set uh, a further hypothesis because we said that the two planets are inclined 
with respect to, to us in the same way. It is not said that this is necessarily the case, but we did it in order to reduce the uh, dimensions of the parameter space. So we're going to change this inclination going from 5 to 90 degrees, and we are going to then to change the masses accordingly, and we let vary the mutual inclination going from the Coplana case up to 80 degrees. Let me introduce you this plot that we're going to see quite uh, a lot of. On the x-axis, we have the mutual inclination between the planets, and on the y-axis, we have the orbital inclination. This means that if you follow an horizontal line, uh, what we are doing is setting the inclination of the system, so we have changed the masses and set the masses, and we are slowly increasing the mutual inclination going from the Coplanar case up to 80 degrees. The plot shows the amplitude of the libration of the angle omega-1. So in dark blue, it means that the libration is very, is very small, and then it means that we are in a lead of cosi resonant regime, while in the dark, in the light blue, we have the circulation uh, of this angle. So these are the results for all the systems that we ended up selecting, and what we see is that all of them um, might have um, no, all of them have a lead of cosi uh, resonant region, meaning that all of them have a, has, have a subset of the uh, parameter space, such that if the initial condition fell in one of these regions, then the system would be in a long-term um, configuration, even if it is highly in 3D. It is a very nice tool, the lead of cosi um, resonance, but it's not said that if a system is not in need of cosine resonance, then it is not in a long-term um, situation. Therefore, uh, for the lead of cosine, we study uh, omega-1, but if we want to have stability in general, we go for a chaos indicator. There are many different kinds of chaos indicators. There are basically tools that classify the orbits as regular or chaotic. We chose a particular one, which is the Magno, so that from now on, what you see in purple is going to be a regular orbit, and what you see in yellow is going to be chaotic. Again, we are applying a tool to an approximation, so we might wonder if actually is working, um, is working well, is, going, is giving us proper results. And what we see by comparing the results between our um, approach and the uh, purely numerical integrations is that the accord is actually pretty good. What we see by comparing the chaos indicator with the lead of cosi um, uh, regions is that it is read as a regular uh, zone, which is nice because it was with the, what, because it was what we expected. Sorry, and what we see as well is that actually we can have long-term stabilities for low values of the mutual inclinations, even if we are not in the lead of cosi. But what is important is that if we want to have a long-term stability um, configuration with high mutual inclination, we have to have the lead of cosi uh, resonance acting because otherwise the orbit is going to destabilize very quickly. We then wanted to uh, extend our um, parametric study to systems that have close-in planets, so to systems that have planets that are very close to the star. Uh, we couldn't do that before because our model wouldn't have described the, um, the system correctly. And this is actually well known. Um, in 1859, um, it was clear that Mercury was not following Newton's laws because the argument of the pericenter, so let's say the point that is closest to, uh, to the star, was moving in a way that was not explicable only by uh, Newton's gravitation laws. This uh, led to uh, many theories. At a certain point, they even theorized the presence of Vulcano and other planets between the Sun and Mercury. Obviously, there is no Vulcano, and we had to wait for the general relativity to explain what was happening. Um, now, as the general relativity is acting on the argument of the pericenter, as is the lead of cosi uh, resonance, it was interesting to, for us to try and see how these two competing effects um, would work or not work together. So, in order to do that, 
we uh, selected new targets and we had to add to our Hamiltonian a term that would uh, describe the action of the general relativity on the inner planet. Once we have done that, we uh, selected new planets by changing a little bit the parameters um, to select the systems. And for the rest, the parametric study is absolutely the same. So here I'm showing the results for two different systems without the general relativity, so purely uh, gravitational forces. And you see that they actually show two quite similar uh, lead of quasi resonant regions. But when we add the general relativity, the things change pretty in a, in a very rele relevant way. In particular, in the second case, we have no lead of quasi region anymore. So these are the results for all the systems in uh, um, the purely gravitational case. But when we add the general relativity, this is what we have found. So for most of the systems, we lose completely um, the lead of quasi uh, resonant region. In fact, uh, we can compute uh, the effect that the different, uh, the, the general relativity and the lead of quasi resonance have on um, the argument of the pericenter, and then we can define a ratio between these two, um, uh, these two, these two magnitudes in order to define which uh, effect is leading. And what we have found is that actually our results correspond perfectly, which tells us that our method is a uh, quick and fast way to uh, study the presence of the lead of quasi uh, region, uh, even in the case of um, the general relativity. So to wrap it up, we talked about the stability of non-coplanar exosolar systems. Uh, we wanted to give ranges for the values of the mutual inclinations um, that are compatible with the long-term stability of the systems. And we did it following two different approaches. In the first one, we developed an algorithm to determine the KM stability. In the second one, we performed an extensive uh, parametric study. And what we have obtained is that, that we can have uh, stability in the KM sense up to 20 degrees. Um, and that uh, in order for a system to be stable on the long term with very high values of the mutual inclination, you have to have uh, the lead of quasi uh, resonance acting. In general, we have found that the general relativity usually destroys the uh, lead of quasi uh, reson resonant regions, and therefore it takes away from the system, let's say, a chance to be uh, stable on the long term. In terms of perspectives, for sure, uh, the uh, KM approach uh, can be improved by weakening some of the heavy requirements that we are setting. And as for the lead of quasi resonance, uh, we could improve it by adding the study with the chaos indicator and expanding the actually the dimension of the parameter space by considering two different inclinations for, um, for the planets. And finally, it would be interesting to actually work with observers during the process to determine the uh, values of the parameters that they can deduct by the observations. Because what I haven't said is that the fact that we um, um, said, think that we are in the best case scenario actually has an effect in the exact values of the parameters that we are um, obtaining from the observations. And therefore, it would be interesting to actively participating in the process in order to um, obtain better results that are more corresponding to, uh, more, more corresponding to the real values. And that's it. Thank you.